Anyway, hi everybody, shalom, and uh, welcome back, uh, those of you that were gone, those of you that were here. And Be'ezer Hashem, you should have a very good, productive zman of learning and uh, growth in Torah and mitzvot. Uh, today is not the fifth of Eeyore, today is the fourth of Eeyore, I believe, which means Yom Atzimut this year is observed a day early, because the Rabbanut HaRashit uh, made a takana, going back to 1948, that when the fifth of Eeyore is Friday, uh, we don't want the celebrations to go into Shabbos, and therefore they make it everything earlier. So the day before Yom Atzimut is Yom Azikaron, the day that we remember the soldiers who died, and Yom Atzimut is the Independence Day, and everything was moved a day early uh, because of Chilol Shabbat. So technically, although it's always funny to apply the classic halachic, uh, halachic uh, terminology, uh, this is a Yom Atzimut. It's not a nitcha, it's not pushed off, but it's uh, a muktam. It's brought to an earlier date. But be it as it may, uh, obviously you've noticed that we're not having a barbecue today. And we didn't say halal. And what's even worse is we just got out of Nisan, but now we're in ear. We had to say the long tachanan, not just the short tachanan. So we got none of the advantages uh, here of Yom Atzmut. Uh So the question becomes, what exactly is going on here? Is it, uh, is it a festive day? Is it a holiday? Is it something that we should celebrate in one way or the other? Or is it uh, a neutral day? There are actually three ways of looking at it. Either it's a bad day, or it's a great day, or it's a neutral day. Uh, like every day is good, but you know, nothing special. So what exactly uh, is the view of, uh, that we should have about this? Now again, when I say we should have, I mean obviously I am not uh, the spokesman of, of Torah Jewelry, and, and what I say is not uh, a final word, but we'll just share some some thoughts uh, about it. First of all, let me first deal with things in the most narrowest sense. And then let me just mention two halachic issues that Yom Atzimut does present. This narrow halachic focus. Uh, issue number one is the issue of music. We are in the period of the counting of the Omer. And we know that during this period of time, the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva died. And they died, Chazal tell us, because they did not show proper honor and respect to each other, and therefore God took them out of the world, not to be leaders of Torah. And maybe uh, another time we'll talk about that uh, at greater length, because it's a very, very important idea. But because of that, uh, at least part of the Omer period, not the whole 49 days, has a certain mourning aspect attached to it. Uh, we don't get married, we don't get haircuts. I mean, there are exceptions to everything, but generally speaking, we don't make the Shechianu bracha, and uh, the minog is not to listen to at least live music. If, if it's uh, recorded, that's a whole shayla, but at least the live instrumental music is the core of the minog, particularly if it's dancing or lebedic uh, wedding type music. So the problem is that Yom Atzmut celebrations are full of music during the Omer period. So halachically, even if I celebrate Yom Atzimut as a very festive day, uh, what permits me to listen to music during the Omer period? Now, it's true that there are certain days of the Omer that are not within the morning period, or some people start from Rosh Chodesh, so they're allowed to listen to music the, the, the week after Pesach, and some will allow it after Lagba Omer. But the one thing for sure, Yom Atzimut is right in the middle uh, between Rosh Chodesh and Lagba Omer, so... You know, no matter what minhag you have, you're going to be caught in the, in the middle of it. So the Rabbanut, uh, the chief rabbinate, all the way back in 1948, took the halachic position that because they regarded Yom Atzimut as a chag, as a holiday, celebrating Hashem's redemption of Am Yisrael, they say the minhag, which is only a minhag of not listening to music during the Omer, is pushed aside. And you're allowed to listen to music. That's the Pesach of the Rabbanut. So they permit you to listen to music. Again, I have to be honest. Uh, yes, the Rabbanut says such a thing, but like nobody else really agrees. I mean, uh, it's true that there are many, many leniencies on the issue of music. Uh, a cappella might be permitted. Recorded might be permitted. Slow music might be permitted. But the one core thing that the Minog absolutely covers is live, instrumental music, that is lively and gay. Uh, uh, you, know, you don't use the word gay anymore in English. But okay, I forgot. I forgot. I was, somehow I was thinking about uh, the way we used to speak English. But okay. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the like. Uh, so L'chaira, what the Rabbanud is maturing, is precisely the core situation 
that for sure is going to be included in the minog. So again, their hashkafa is, it's a yumtif, it overrides everything, but most poskim do not agree. So issue number one is a narrow halakhic issue about music. Okay. Issue number two, which is connected, is the recitation of halo. Do you recite halo in Yom Atzmud? Now once again, I can tell you, maybe some of you uh, in the future will want to be synagogue rabbis, maybe in the United States, some of you uh, might, uh, might actually do that. So I can tell you ahead of time, of course, hopefully Mashiach will be here way before then, but if chas v'shalom not, uh, be prepared. One of the big interview questions that virtually every Orthodox congregation asks candidates uh, for the rabbinate is, what's your position on Yom Matzmot? And I can tell you as a candidate who sat at some interviews, although not a lot of interviews, you know, you're thinking to yourself, what do they want me to say? <laughs> should, that shouldn't be the answer, but Lamai say, you know, when you're in an interview, you're always like, hmm, do they want me to do this or do that? Uh, right, so be a little, a little prepared. And there are many, many minhagim. The Rabbanot, Paskins, Hallel with a bracha. With a bracha, mamish. Other people say Hallel without a bracha. Other people say half Hallel without a bracha, like Rosh Chodesh, because it's not the same. And some people will say Hallel in its regular position in davening after Shemona Esrei. And some people, to show that it's not the, the regular Hallel, they'll say it after davening and the like. So we have all sorts of variations, ranging from full Hallel with bracha to half Hallel after davening to the Orsameach Minag, which is, of course, the Minag of, of most, uh, all, really all of the Haredi Yeshiva world, uh, that we don't say Hallel at, at all, and I'll discuss what that issue is. Now, once again, uh, I'm going to be non-political here, and just, I just want to talk about it from the standpoint of narrow halacha. The Gemara in Megillah raises a question, why we don't recite Hallel on Purim. After all, Purim, our, our lives were in danger, and we were rescued, Purim ought to have a halal. So the Gemara gives three reasons why you don't say halal on Purim. One re two of the reasons are not no geya yom atzmot, but the third reason is. So I'll just mention the three reasons so you'll know all three reasons. Reason number one is the Megillah itself is how we praise Hashem on Purim. So the halal of Purim is the reading of the Megillah. Ad kach that the Me'iri actually says, that if you're on a desert island and you didn't bring your Megillah, but you happen to have your sitter, you should say halal with the bracha, because you don't have the Megillah to be a substitute for halal. Okay, that's reason number one. Reason number two, the Gemara says, is we do not say halal on miracles that happen outside of the land of Israel. And since most of the Jews in the Purim story were not living in Eretz Yisrael, Therefore, we don't say halal on miracles that occurred outside of the land of Israel. Now, I hope you immediately have a question in your mind. Well, wait a second. What about the halal of Pesach? The halal of Pesach celebrates Yitzias Mitzrayim. We were not in Eretz Yisrael when we were taken out of Egypt. So why do I say halal there? The Gemara asks the Kasha, and the Gemara's answer is, until we got to Eretz Yisrael, then... Any miracle would suffice, but once we got to Eretz Yisrael and were then exiled, we only say Hallel on a miracle which is in Eretz Yisrael, not when it's in Chutzlars. Okay, now those two reasons are not relevant to Yom Ha'atzmut. Yom Ha'atzmut doesn't have a Megillah, and Yom Ha'atzmut uh, happened in Eretz Yisrael. But the Gemara gives a third reason, and this is very critical. The third reason the Gemara gives for Yom Ha'atzmut, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, for, for not saying Hallel on Purim, is that you only say Hallel when the redemption is complete. By that I mean like by Hanukkah, we got rid of Greek rule over Eretz Yisrael. But in the case of Purim, even after we got rid of Haman, we were still at risk. We're still under the reign of Achashverosh. And what would stop Achashverosh from getting another Haman the next day? We're not out of the hot water. We are still in danger. And when you're still in danger, even after the salvation, there is no halal. Now, some have suggested, just from a pure halachic, non-ideological standpoint, that if the halal of Yom Ha'atzma'ut is based on the notion that this is the day that by God giving us independence, we were able to be free from our enemies, it actually was not true. Because the 5th of Eeyore, 1948, which was the day that we declared, that the State of Israel declared independence, 
was the beginning of a war in which hostile nations wage war against us. So it's a, if, if we say that even after Haman got killed and Achashverosh was very nice to us, we still say we're in hot water and therefore we can't say Hallel, one would argue Kalvachomer uh, when Yom Atzmut there was actually the initiation of a state of, of war. That's why Rav Schechter of Yeshiva University differentiates between the fifth of year, or today's, this year is the fourth of year, Yom Hatzmot, the day of independence, uh, versus the 28th of year, in a few weeks from now, which is again a very important day, Yom Yerushalayim, that was the day in the Six Day War that we regained the Temple Mounts and the old city the, of Yerushalayim, a very great simcha. So I believe Rav Schechter does not say Hallel on Yom Hatzmaut, although he celebrates it. He does not, he does say Hallel, he does say Hallel with a brach, I believe on Yom Yerushalayim, because he says Yom Yerushalayim is not about the safety and security of the Jewish people, because for that we're still in danger, but it's about specifically getting access to the Beis HaMikdash, which is a separate type of simcha for which there could be a halal. So this is all non-ideological, meaning even if Yom HaTzmut is wonderful and the state of Israel is a miracle from God and it's a, we should celebrate it, and I'll talk about that issue in a moment, but halachically the issue of halal is, is an issue based on the Gemara in Maseches Megillah. Again, uh, the Rabbanut uh, HaRashit has indeed uh, ruled that Hallel uh, should be recited. Uh, most of the yeshiva world, or at least the Haredi yeshiva world, uh, does not accept that. I'm not here to impugn or validate one view or the other, just to report uh, what those different views are. Of course, it's very, very classic, pun the Panevich yeshiva, which is uh, the epitome of the Haredi yeshiva, right? one of the greatest yeshivas in the world. So uh, one would not call it a Zionist institution by any stretch of the imagination, but the founder of that yeshiva, who was the great Panevich Rav, Rav Shlomo Yosef Kahanaman, who died all the way back in 1968, uh, he was, uh, besides being a Godel B'Torah Mamesh, he was a, a supporter of the State of Israel and he instituted the minog of flying the Israeli flag on Yom HaTzma'ut. Uh, and uh, although the ideological direction of Panevich has moved very, very, very far away from that idea, I believe they still raised the flag in honor of, uh, not, not in honor of the State of Israel, but in honor of the Panevich Rav where they could not depart from. Uh, in Panovich, for many years, I'm not sure what's the way they do it now, they didn't say Hawa, but they also didn't say Tachanun. And somebody once, this is the Panovich Rav was a man of great, great humor and wit, besides Torah learning. So somebody once asked the Panovich Rav, if you're such a Zionist, such a supporter of the state of Israel, how can you not say Hallel on the great day of independence? And the Panovich Rav says, you're accusing me of not being a Zionist? I follow the minog of Ben-Gurion on Yom Atzmut. I do exactly what Ben-Gurion does. Doesn't say Tachanan, doesn't say Halo. What are you accusing me? <laughs> <laughs> Ben-Gurion doesn't have it. <laughs> that was the basic, uh, the, basic, the basic idea. So on one hand, the Panevich Rav, who absolutely was a Godel B'Torah, and I mean, I don't like to use labels, but he was a Godel in the Haredi world, meaning absolutely a Godel B'Torah, uh, Paskin for his great yeshiva, that they should not say Tachanan. On the other hand, another Godel Hador, the Chazenish, both of them in Bnei Brak, both in Bnei Brak, uh, earlier had gone exactly the opposite. They record a story that uh, a bris occurred on the fifth of year. And at a bris, when you're at a bris, you don't say Tachanun. The Chazenish actually paskins. They should say Tachanun at a bris that he was present on Yom Atzmaut because he was afraid that if he wouldn't have, uh, I'm sorry, if they, would have, if they wouldn't have said Tachanun, people would say, oh, the Chazanish doesn't say Tachanun on Yom Atzmat. So he actually said it's Kedai to break the Halacha. So those are two, two opposite extremes. Now, okay, but overall, what's our orientation, though? What's the, what's the orientation? So uh, first of all, let me just point out, and again, maybe this is semantics, and I don't want to make a big deal, but just to bring it out, something to think about. For some people, the word Atzmaut, rubs them the wrong way. Atzma'ut is a modern Hebrew term uh, referring to uh, liberation, freedom, emancipation. The notion that you celebrate emancipation, well, of course, Pesach we also call Zaman Chei but some say emancipation is not really what we're looking for. 
uh, we're looking for the notion of freedom from oppression so that we can serve Hashem, so that we can do mitzvot. Chazal say, Ein ben chorin olimish osek batorah. The only person that's truly free is one who submits to the Torah. Now, obviously, uh, nobody really wants, well, most people do not want the theocracy. We, we don't want to impose religion on people. We understand that people have to make their own choices. But still, the goal of a Jewish state, the, the razan diatra of a Jewish state, should be in the direction of Torah and mitzvot and Jewish ethics and Jewish morality. And atzmaut connotes too much of the idea is I want to be independent, I want to be free. There's the same criticism people have of the Hatikva. Hatikva is, of course, the uh, Israeli national anthem. And it ends, Liot am chafshi biartzeinu that this was our dream for 2,000 years, to be, right, al payim shana, to be chafshi, am chafshi, to be a free nation. So some people, I, I don't fully agree with the criticism, because chafshi means, you know, free from uh, the umot ha'olam. Okay, but, but some people say, why do you define the goal of a Jewish state to be free? I think Rav Aaron Soloveitchik had suggested that instead of liot am chafshi biartzenu, the Hatikva should be changed, Liot Am Kadosh Biyatseinu, to be a holy nation in our land. So these are some semantic things. Again, I, I can't say that they move me so much, but some people, Atzma'ut, independence, Liot Am Chafshi. The goal of a Jewish state is to kind of create an environment where people will at least have the freedom and the opportunity, not coercive, not coercion, to serve Hashem and live by the values of of Judaism. For example, even many people who are not religious, I'll, I'll give you a little example of this. Not everybody, but there are a lot of people who are not religious who are in favor of buses not running on Shabbats and stores not being open on Shabbats. They say, listen, privately, I want to watch TV. I want to violate Shabbos. That's fine. That's freedom of religion or non-religion. But they say the public face of the state of Israel should be that Shabbos has a special role. Now, that's not universally held. There are secular Jews who indeed say they don't want any recognition. But part of that is, that's part of a reaction to the overreaction on the other side, meaning if I'm trying to force you to be from, you're going to force me to acknowledge your right to be totally secular. It's kind of that push and that pull. But intrinsically, in their heart of hearts, there are many secular Jews who actually acknowledge the idea that the public face of the state of Israel should respect the Shabbat and the holidays, even if I privately, you know, I don't, don't keep them and, and the like. So those are some semantic issues. But let's go over generally. What is the Torah's view on a Jewish state? Jewish statehood. Is Jewish statehood a good thing or a bad thing? So here, we don't have time to go over all of the sources, but just to share a few, a few sources. Uh, you, you've, all, you've all heard of the movement uh, here in Jerusalem and London, other places, the United States as well, small group called Nature Karta. Now, Nature Karta means Guardians of the City. That's the name they, the movement gave themselves. And they have a view that it is forbidden to have a Jewish political state until the coming of Mashiach. And I want to emphasize that is not because that is not because uh, the people who run the state are not religious. Even if every single member of the Knesset and every single cabinet member and every single government worker uh, was a tzaddik and a gadol and a talmud chacham, a new shas, totally from, the actual statehood itself is considered to be a rebellion against God. This is in the Turi Karta position, also the Satmir position based on the idea that if Hashem put us into Golos, uh, only God can take us out by the coming of Mashiach. Now, that does not mean you don't live in Israel. They say we can live in Israel. Living in Israel is a wonderful thing. Uh, it's a holy land, but it shouldn't be under Jewish sovereignty. It should be under British, Turkish, Arab, whatever it would be. Now, in some ways, this Naturi Karta direction has moved into the direction of almost fantasy, fantasy world, because they basically say, Turn over the state of Israel to the Palestinians. So not a two-state solution, a one-state solution, but only in the Palestinian direction. And it's a Dover Pashat, Naturi Karta says, or at least some 
extreme parts of the Torah Karta, that if we were to give up Jewish sovereignty, the lovely Arabs would give us total freedom of religion and learning Torah, and uh, we would live in a wonderful world of peace. And if there is war and if there is terrorism, that's only because of the Zionistic imperialism, uh, which seeks political sovereignty. Now, at that point, that becomes a little bit of an insane position, and it reminds me a lot of a lovely story. Some people say the story's not true, so I don't want to say it's definitively true, so don't send me an email that the story is not true. As that's the problem with the camera. They're always like, you know, the story's not true. I know, I know the story's not true, but I'm going to tell you it anyway because it exemplifies something that is true. The story goes that in 1968, Hubert Humphrey was running, he was uh, Lyndon Johnson's vice president. He was running as the Democratic candidate for president against Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon won that election. Humphrey was a liberal senator from Minnesota before he was vice president, and Humphrey was a real Fabrenta Zionist. He was, he was not Jewish, but he was a big, big supporter of the Jewish state prior to 1948. He goes, he goes all the way back. So he hears there's a big group of Jews in Williamsburg, happened to be Satmar Hasidim, that vote in mass. So he figures, he says, he wants to make a campaign stop in Williamsburg. So he goes to Williamsburg, and of course, they only know Yiddish, so he has, an, an, he has an interpreter, and he's giving a speech. There is no Zionist in the United States Senate as strong as I was. I supported the state of Israel ever since 1945 in World War II. I was pushing for a Jewish state. And he figured he would get the support of all these Jews. And then he notices that they're kind of looking at him with a very blank expression on his face. And he realizes something is wrong, and one of his aides catches it. And one of the Jewish aides goes over to the Satmar Rav and apologizes. He says, please forgive, you know, Humphrey doesn't know the dynamic of the Jewish community. And the Satmar Rav says, there's nothing wrong with what Humphrey did. He says, I am against the Jewish state, but that is a family dispute. I have a dispute with my fellow Jews, and I want the state to be dismantled peacefully and the like. But as long as there are Yidden in danger, I want to do whatever can be done to protect them. So if we need military assistance to the state of Israel so that Jewish people will not die, whether they be soldiers or civilians, I am in support of military aid to the state of Israel, even though I actually believe the state of Israel should not exist. Because ultimately, this is a fight within the family and family members disagree, but when it comes to outsiders attacking us, I'm going to side with my family. That is a lovely story. Some say it's not true. I, I don't know, but it exemplifies the idea that even an anti-Zionist cares or should care about the Jewish people and the survival of the Jewish people. There's another version of the story that's also very witty in which uh, there was uh, some non-Jewish commentator that talked about the Jewish state as racist and it shouldn't exist and it ought to be dismantled. So somebody went to the Satmar Rebbe and said, wow, isn't it great that this very influential commentator agrees with your position? The Satmar Rebbe says, what do I have to do with him? I come to my position because I learned Gemara, Rishonim, I have different views. This guy doesn't know the Gemara, he doesn't know the Rishonim. Why is he against the state of Israel? He's just an anti-Semite, meaning he has no reason to, he says, I have reasons to be against the state. He has no reasons. He's just an anti-Semite. What's my connection? What's my connection with him? So this is the ideological position of the Jewish culture. And I just want to point out that although, by and large, it is a minority position today, that's true. But prior to 1948, it was a much more mainstream position that you might have imagined. Even Rav Shimshon Raphael Hirsch, who was kind of a modern, moderate thinker in some ways, writes, this goes back to the 18, uh, 1860s, 1870s, way before even Theodore Herzl, he writes that it's not proper for the Jewish people to focus on building a political state until the Mashiach comes, Mamish Nuturi Karta uh, position. Uh, this was, of course, the, the, the brisker position, still is to some degree the brisker position. So it's not an insane position. In fact, this was Chabad's position, although Chabad eventually became fairly Zionist in its orientation, but the Rebbe Rashab, Rav Shalom Ber, in the 1920s, wrote exactly it, that a Jewish state would be, 
would be a, a, a bad thing until Mashiach comes. Now again, this extreme view does not depend on from or not from, even if it's from, no good. So that's one view. There is another view that says Jewish statehood might be a wonderful, wonderful thing, but it's not proper to create a state in conjunction with people who do not accept Torah and mitzvot because that is called collaboration with Rishayim, and there's kind of a problem in collaborating with Rishayim, and this was actually the position of Rav Chaim of Brisk, Rav Chaim of Brisk, who was a great lover of Eretz Yisrael and a supporter of the Yishuv of Eretz Yisrael, uh, was against uh, any type of formal affiliation with segments of Jewry who were not totally religious. Now, the truth of the matter is, this itself, each of these things are a huge topic because we do find in various kehilos in Am Yisrael that there often was collaboration on non-religious matters between religious and non-religious, and that was not considered lehitchaber barasha, uh, etc. Uh, so, but once again, that's yet another issue. A third issue about statehood was the problem of endangering. Now, this is a real difficult prognostication. That is, we know that preservation of Jewish life is the most important thing, pikuach nefesh. So the question is, it's hard to know. Was the creation of a Jewish state in the aggregate, did it save Jewish lives? Or did it cause more people to die? This is a uh, difficult question. Um, there are those that say, that Medinat Yisrael, particularly in the aftermath of the Holocaust, as a haven and a refuge for Jewish people from persecuted parts of the world, saved the Jewish lives who would otherwise perish. There are those who make the counter-argument that the various wars and terrorism endangered populations that would not have been endangered under the old system. Again, I'm not here to give you a psak. I mean, I'll give you a, a final word as, as I end it, but just to point out that this is a third issue of concern in the establishment of the state. In other words, issue number one, Yuturi Karta, can't have a state until the coming of Mashiach. Uh, issue number two, Hitchabrut, connection to Rishayim. Uh, then, you, of course, you get a question, are people Rishayim just because they're not religious? That itself is going to be an interesting controversy. And issue number three, uh, what some regarded as the reckless endangerment of Jewish populations, both in Israel and outside of Israel, in the Chutz Loritz as well, whose lives might have been spared had there not been a push for Jewish statehood. Again, that's a very controversial statement, and uh, one would have to weigh it, and uh, I cannot say we could definitively show one way or the other on that, but those would be the three concerns uh, militating against the establishment of a Jewish state. But all of that is before you have a Jewish state. Don't do it because of this. Don't do it because of that. Don't do it because of that. But now you have a Jewish state. And there are millions and millions and millions of Jews who live here. So obviously, once you have a state, unless you mamish take Naturi Karta extremism, you've got to worry about the Jews that are here, about the society that's here. You've got to protect them. This is, I would suggest explains the shift in view of Chabad. I had mentioned that the Rebbe Rav Shalom Ber Schneerson, back in the 1920s, when there was not yet a state of Israel, said, shouldn't have a Zionist state. Wrong. And yet we know the last Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rav Menachem Mendel Schneerson, was a very, very big supporter of the state. In fact, he was very much against territorial concessions. He connected Rav Shach and Rav Vaji Yosef, and he said, you can't give back an inch of land. And it seems to me, again, I, I am not a spokesman for Chabad, but it seems to me that the Rebbe's concerns were pragmatic more than ideological, meaning the Rebbe was not saying statehood is a wonderful thing, but the Rebbe is saying that when you have seven, eight, nine million people who are living in Eretz Yisrael, we have a responsibility to create the safest and strongest environment that uh, we could possibly create and therefore, ex post facto, what you do be the Eved with a state is going to be very, very different than whether a state should have been established in the first place. So, but, so what does that imply for Yom Atzimut? So let's look at the opposite side of the coin. I gave you some negatives. So I hope I didn't paint too much of a dark picture. Oh, by the way, there's yet another factor. 
You know, in the Zionist movement itself, there were two major streams. And I'm talking about non-religious Zionism. You had the Theodore Herzl view, and then you had a view of uh, some Zionist thinkers, such as Usher Ginsburg, who is known as Achad Ha'am. And that's uh, the way this is often described is political Zionism versus cultural Zionism. Herzl's vision was clearly to have a state, a state with an army, with a police department, with international relations, because Herzl saw statehood as normalization, making the Jews like everybody else, and normalization would be the secret, Herzl thought, to getting rid of anti-Semitism. Again, that was proven wrong, uh, but, but again, I'm not here to impugn Herzl. Herzl's intentions, I actually believe, were very, very noble. Uh, but uh, he was wrong, but, but his, his shita was political normalization and statehood will get rid of the curse of European anti-Semitism, which he experienced firsthand as a reporter uh, on the, covering the trial of Colonel Alfred Dreyfus, who was an officer in the French army, uh, who was convicted of espionage and sentenced to Devil's Island. And it was apparent to any observer worldwide that this was a trumped-up charge that was based on anti-Semitism, and that got Herzl's wheels to start thinking about statehood as a solution. Now, another group of Zionists, like Achad Ha'am, Zionists were against statehood, not because of the Carta, although it comes out to be the same result, but because they said Judaism is about culture, it's about knowledge, it's about understanding, even though they weren't from per se, it's about philosophy of life, it's about ethics. When you get your hands dirty in the messy world of politics, you get corrupted, you get besmirched. So Achad Ha'am, as he was called, that was his pen name, Achad had this vision that let the British run the country, let the Turkish run the country, let anybody run the country, and we will sit under our fig tree and play flute music and harps and study Hegel and Spinoza and all of those guys. Kind of a very dreamlike vision. Again, it wasn't necessarily religiously based. That was interesting. But it was kind of the culture of knowledge and wisdom. Martin Buber who became a very distinguished academic at Hebrew University, was exactly of that, of that ilk. He came to Israel before 1948, and he did not... So the anti-Zionist is not only uh, Nuturi Karta. There were like Zionist intellectuals who wanted Zionism to be a cultural phenomenon, not a political phenomenon. Okay? Oh, so now let's talk about the counter-arguments. Are there reasons why statehood is good from the perspective of Judaism and Torah? So first, I want to point out the following. Uh, most people have heard that there is a big machlokas, Rambam and Ramban, Maimonides, Nachmanides, if living in Israel is a Torah commandment or not. Maimonides does not mention it as a commandment, although there are different interpretations why he doesn't. But Nachmanides, Ramban, specifically says Living in Israel is one of the 613 mitzvahs of the Torah. According to Ramban, there is a halachic obligation to live in Eretz Israel unless you have an exemption for Torah learning or, or various other reasons. So a lot of people know that. A lot of people have heard that according to the Ramban, Yishuv Eretz Israel is a mitzvah saseh min Torah. But what a lot of people don't know is the Ramban subdivides Yishuv Eretz Yisrael into a number of discrete components. One of those components is to live here, and even a Tarikarta could do that by living here. But there's another component, and that is the mitzvah of Yishuv Eretz Yisrael is to establish Jewish sovereignty over all land that is within the biblical boundaries of the land of Israel, which, is, by the way, is much larger than the present state of Israel. We wouldn't be talking about giving back the West Bank. We'd be, we'd be talking about getting back the East Bank <laughs> because that was part of the land of the two and a half tribes. So according to Ramban, it's important to note this. Not only are you permitted to establish a Jewish state, the Ramban considers the establishment of Jewish sovereignty 
as a Torah obligation, nichlal in Yisha Eretz Yisrael. Now, this is something a lot of people don't notice. Everybody thinks, oh, the only thing the Ramban says is there's a mitzvah to live in the land of Israel. He does say that. Yeah, he does say that. But that's not the only thing he says. He says there's a mitzvah to establish Jewish sovereignty. And, by the way, he makes the point, he specifically rejects the Tere Karta, that this even applies when there's no Beis HaMikdash. And it even applies when there's no king, and it even applies Bisman Azeh. In other words, he, he kind of forestalls the argument you're going to make that this only gets activated when, when Mashiach comes. So first of all, we have the Ramban's view that Yeshua Veret Yisrael does uh, create a mitzvah to create a Jewish political sovereignty. And I would also point out that there's a passage in the Rambam, although the Rambam does not bring this as a mitzvah, when the Rambam discusses why we celebrate Hanukkah, right? Why do we celebrate Hanukkah? So a lot of us would say, oh, I celebrate Hanukkah because there was a miracle that the oil that should have lasted one day burnt for eight days, right? That's one reason. Or I celebrate Hanukkah because we rededicated the Beis HaMikdash. That's what the word Hanukkah actually means, rededication. And all of that is true. But you know what the Rambam says? The Rambam says, the reason we celebrate Hanukkah is because Hanukkah enabled us to establish a Jewish state free from the rule of the Yavanim. And we had that Jewish state for more than a hundred years until the Romans came in. And therefore the holiday of Hanukkah is really Yom Hatzmaut. It is a holiday celebrating Jewish independence. Now, what's so interesting about that, the notion of celebrating Jewish independence, is the fact that the Hasmonean dynasty, although the original Ma Maccabees were very righteous people, but as you know, the next generation, they became Hellenistic. They became persecutors of the Chachamim. If any of you ever read George Orwell's uh, book, uh, Animal Farm, Sure. Uh, so uh, you'll recall that this is a parody of the Russian Revolution, uh, where the revolutionaries against the Tsar become just as bad or worse than the Tsar itself. So the animals that overthrow the humans, some of them become dictators. Right? That's the, that was Orwell's parody of the Russian Revolution. Well, the Hasmoneans were exactly the same way. They overthrew the Greek Hellenistic persecution in Eretz Yisrael. Baruch Hashem. But what did they become? They became Hellenists. They became persecutors of the Chachamim. They became their own enemy. Like the famous cartoon in Pogo. We have met the enemy and he is us. We become the enemy. And yet, and yet, the Rambam says, Chanukah celebrates Jewish sovereignty. Do you see the, the, the point I'm making? Meaning people say, how can you celebrate, you know, non-religious governments? How can you celebrate all of that? Well, that's what the Rambam says Hanukkah is about. When Yidden get freedom in Eretz Yisrael, that is something that is worthy of celebration, even if the Malchus is not uh, completely religious. So, so one perspective, once again, is the idea that Jewish sovereignty is considered to be a simcha. Now, there's another theme that emerges, which is more controversial, and that is viewing the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel and even the establishment of a Jewish state as part of the process that will bring Mashiach. Now, this is different than the Ramban. The Ramban simply locates it as a mitzvah. And the Rambam locates it as a simcha. But there's another theme that it's part of a messianic process. That Mashiach can come in different ways. If we are truly deserving, Mashiach will come with miracles and the temple will come out of the sky. Yeah. But if we're not that worthy, Mashiach will eventually come, but it'll come as a culmination of a political and military process, which will work in the world of economics and the world of politics and the world of war. And even though this is Baderech HaTeva, this seems to be nature, it doesn't appear to be supernatural. But that's how Mashiach comes when we're not completely worthy of these great miracles. So this is a different perspective. This is seeing the return of the people as part of the process of redemption. 
in so many ways. Kibbutz Goliath, how millions of Jews who are living in other places are coming home. Some are coming home for positive reasons. They want to live here. Some come for negative reasons. They get, they're persecuted. Okay, either way. Hashem has different ways to bring us to Eretz Israel. Everybody gets, comes here eventually. Some people come, they call it, you can either be pulled here or you could be pushed here. <laughs> pulled here is, I want to come here because I have a pull. I'm pulled by the holiness of Eretz Israel. That's the best reason. It's better to be pulled here. But Hashem has a contingency plan. For those who don't feel the pull, they feel the push. And the push is, uh, you know, life is hard, persecution. Uh, even in the United States, where Baruch Hashem is still a free society, but a lot of things are falling apart in the United States, and a lot of people are rethinking the need to come here. Right? Push or pull. But nevertheless, the return of the Jews to the land after a very significant absence of almost 2,000 years, at least to a large degree, is a sign of redemption. Another sign of redemption is the fertility of the land in quite an amazing way. The Gemara in Kesuvah says, Eretz Yisrael is like a mother who only cooks for her children. She doesn't cook for some outside people. Mark Twain, who was not Jewish, visited what was called Palestine in the 19th century. He visited a lot of countries and he wrote a book, uh, Innocence Abroad, about his journeys in different countries. And when he came to Palestine, which was then uh, part of the Ottoman Empire, there were, some, there were always some Jews there, but very, very small, maybe 50,000 Jews, whatever it would be. And he saw a land that was desolate, non-productive, dusty, filthy, dirty, and nobody was doing anything. And he was wondering, he writes in his very eloquent way. Mark Twain was a great writer. He says, like, how could this be the chosen land? Why would any normal God of normal intelligence choose this dusty, dirty place to be his holy land? And nothing could be grown here. The land was very unproductive. But then the Gemara tells us when the Jews return, the fertility of the land gets rejuvenated. So if you see trees and grain, it's more, not so much around Yerushalayim, but you go up north, you see all the fertility of Eretz Yisrael. So people think, oh, that's Israeli ingenuity, and there we know we're smarter, and we know how to do things. All right, Baruch Hashem. Some of that is true. But there's a spiritual dimension. The land is welcoming us back. Just like mom will bring out your favorite food when you go home. Eretz Yisrael brings out all of its produce to Am Yisrael. So the return of the exiles from the four corners of the earth and the fertility of Eretz Yisrael and the fact that although we have been dispersed for so many years, Hashem created this opportunity to come back. Many see this not just as something to be grateful for, but many see it as part of the messianic unfolding of Geulah. And if it's not totally supernatural, because we still have wars, and if it's, you know, so many non-religious people are involved in the state, this just means that this is part of the messianic process that may not necessarily follow some miraculous supernatural way. But in truth, it is, it is miraculous and it is supernatural, although not in the, well, miraculous, not in the supernatural way. But the fact that we're able to be here is really, really amazing. So many say, well, we don't have the right to say this is part of Mashiach, you know, who knows? So I think that the ultimate bottom line, and I know I've been just going back and forth on a lot of things here. I hope it hasn't been too disjointed. The bottom line is this. I don't know if this is part of the messianic process or it's not part of the messianic process. I don't know. But I do know, number one, that halachically, it was considered to be a mitzvah like the Ramban, to establish Jewish sovereignty. And more importantly, we have to have hakara satov for what Hashem has given us, a place where we can come, a place where every Jew has automatic citizenship, a place that although we have many, many disagreements with the government, and Baruch Hashem, we live in a democratic society where we fight over those disagreements, but the government itself is a major, major supporter of Torah learning. Uh, we have an army that, with Hashem's 
Psiyata Dishmaya can protect us in so many good ways. So it would seem that at a minimum, whether you like the word Atzmo'ot or you don't like the word Atzmo'ot, whether you say Halal or half Halal or don't say Halal, whether you follow the Rabbanut and listen to music or, as you should, not listen to music. Those are details. But overall, one needs to have Hakara Satov that Jews are, allow, are able to come here, are able to flourish, are able to learn, able to do mitzvahs. And we have to be grateful to Hashem, even if you don't accept it as a messianic revelation. Accept it as a gift. A gift that rose from the ashes of the Holocaust. A gift that came into the world at our lowest point. A point that we had lost six million people and Kedoshim and Gedolim and Torah. And this was a little kiss from Hashem. Not, doesn't explain the Holocaust. I'm not, I'm not explaining the Holocaust. But Hashem said, I haven't forgotten about you. I haven't abandoned you. And Hakara Satov is something we need to have. Now, Hakara Satov is first and foremost to God. First and foremost. But Hakara Satov also includes a human dimension. You know, we have uh, a lot of disagreements right now uh, with the army and the government, especially regarding the various changes to the draft exemption for yeshiva students. Again, if you're an American citizen, if you're not an Israeli citizen, it doesn't bother you directly. But, you know, for those that are Israeli citizens, it's a major, major issue. And we debate this. You know, there are people that say, in fact, that's our position, that, you know, full-time Torah learning is essential for the security of the state of Israel. Very true. Others say, well, why can't you combine military service and Torah learning like the Hester yeshivas do? Okay, these are issues. We debate these issues. We discuss these issues. We have machloksim about these issues. We try to establish the, the correct position on these issues. And, you know, that's fine. That's what we do. That's our achrayas. We have to do that. But that shouldn't obscure the fact that we have to be grateful even if I believe yeshiva students should not go to the army if they're full-time learning, even if I believe that you cannot take them away from the Beis HaMedrash, I still have to have gratitude to the soldiers who do give their lives, who risk their lives, so that Am Yisrael will be safe. In fact, we have to be grateful to the police, to the fire department, to the street cleaners, to the garbage collectors, from or not from, because they create an infrastructure within which it is possible to create the societies of Torah and mitzvos that we want to create. Without that infrastructure, we wouldn't have been able to do it. So they also have a chilek in whatever mitzvos we do, because without them, we wouldn't be able to do it. Hakara satov, that's the two words to underline here. So again, whether you celebrate this day officially or not officially is frankly not that important, really. You know, you can do what you want uh, other, other than saying, I don't think you should say hello with the bracha or listen to live music. Anything else is up to you. But the notion of gratitude to Hashem and to the, state of, and to the uh, instrumentalities of the state of Israel is something that, that we need to have. And that's a very important point. I've mentioned many times before that the very word Yehudi, Jew, comes from Leah calling your fourth child Yehuda, I am grateful to God. So the very translation of Jew is be a grateful person. When you don't have hakara satov, you are behaving in an un-Jewish way. Because Jewish means grateful. I'm not giving you a dresser, I'm giving you a translation. Jew means grateful person. That is the translation of the word Jew. When I'm not grateful, therefore, I am not behaving in a Jewish way. And I think that's the ultimate lesson. Now, the, the prize, the pot at the end of the rainbow is this. And I also quote this passage quite a lot. Shlomo HaMelech says, Kemayim ha'panim el panim Cain leifa adam li adam. As water reflects the face that you show the water, 
so too the heart of a person reflects that which you show the person. So the Vilna Gaon explains, when I look at a reflecting pool of water, whatever face I show the water is the face I'll see. I smile at the water, I see a smiling face. I frown at the water, I see a frowning face. So too, the heart of a human being reflects back that's which I show that person. I show you respect. I show you love. I show you concern. You will feel that way about me. I show you disparagement. I show you that you don't count. You're going to think that way about me. If you think about it, part of the polarization of religious and secular is based so much on the vicious cycle of continuous denigration, right? So a Haredi might call a Chiloni, you know, an Apikoris or a Molek. The Chiloni calls the Haredi a parasite on society. So one guy's a parasite, another guy's a Molek. Where does that conversation going to teach you? So you're going to go deeper and deeper and deeper in finding new and creative ways of insulting the other person. But if we were to start with the ethic of Hakara Satov, I'm grateful for what you do. I'm machshiv what you do. Then, even the secular Jew would then look at me in a different light and say, you know, this Torah learning really is important in the Jewish nation. So that's kind of the consolation, or the, you know, the prize that you get. That is, by developing Hakara Satov towards others, you will have people have a karasa type towards you. Now, people sometimes say, well, why do I have to be the first one? You know, let the secular world be grateful to me, and then I'll, I'll be grateful to them. Why are you telling me I have to be grateful if they don't appreciate me? The answer is, you're a Torah Jew. So you follow the Torah. You follow the values of the Torah. You don't say, I wait for somebody else to do the right thing. I got to do the right thing. And the right thing is to appreciate to be makar tov, not to look down, not to disparage. And through that hakara satov, we will be zocha to kamayim upon him, upon him, kain lay for adam li adam. So, again, I hope I didn't uh, thoroughly confuse you. Uh, but as I say, I think uh, that Yom Atzmut does have a, a role in raising our consciousness of gratitude to Hashem for what He put into our lives and gratitude to the human beings who create the infrastructure and the security that allows us to serve him. One final story, this is really connected to Yom HaZikaron, but Yom HaTzimut is also connected. Uh, Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach, one of the great, great, great Gedolim, uh, once had a Talmud that told him that he was going up to Tzfat to daven at the graves of the Tzadikim, the Arizal, Rav Zikaro, the great, great Tzadikim in Tzfat. And Rav Shlomo Zalman said to him, I don't know why you're traveling two and a half hours or three hours uh, to go up there when I have the need to daven by the kever of a tzaddik I go to the military cemetery on Mount Herzl which is right nearby at Fagan that's where Rav Shlomo Zalman's yeshiva was called Torah and I daven by the grave of a chayal who gave his life for the Jewish people and that person is a tzaddik. And that person is worthy to have prayers answered in their merit. Now, there are two versions of the story, so I don't want to take a definitive side on this. One version said, even if the soldier was not religious. Another said, if it's a Shomer Shabbos soldier, so, so there's a machlokas how far he went. But certainly, Rav Orbach made the point that the person who gives his life for the Jewish people is a person that's very, very worthy of admiration. Even if we take the position that yeshiva students should not go to the army, that's a, that's a separate position, and that's a very, very defensible position. But that has nothing to do with gratitude for those who are making that sacrifice. So, Be'ezras Hashem, uh, I hope that uh, we can learn uh, from uh, these experiences, and may all of this be a precursor to the coming of Mashiach that should be Bimheira Vyameinu. Thank you.